Okay, in this video we'll be looking at statistical and critical thinking. And pretty much we'll be looking at uh, three different things that are related to statistical thinking and critical thinking. And we'll look at some examples of uh, situations where we have to uh, use statistical thinking or critical thinking. Okay, now in this section we're going to, it provides an overview of the process involved in conducting a statistical study. One is prepare, the second is analyze, and the third is conclude. Okay, now we'll look at the first concept, and that's uh, prepare. Okay, and part of preparing, you have to do context, you have to look at the source of the data, and you have to look at your sampling method. So the first thing we'll look at is context when we're preparing. We want to ask ourselves these, these two questions. What do the data mean and what is the goal of the study? Okay. So here you have data, but you want to know what that data is and what it means. Okay. Could be test scores. It could be uh, final letter grades. It could be uh, post rates of men and women. Okay, because you want to know what that data means. And also, with that data, you want to find out what the goal of the study is. If you're trying to find out if a certain particular uh, educational program will have an impact on student achievement, then that will pretty much be your goal of your uh, study or purpose of the study, for example. Okay, next is the source of the data under preparing. You want to ask yourself, is the source objective or is it biased? Okay. And you do want to be vigilant and skeptical of studies from sources that may be biased. And then you have to have a sampling method. And then ask yourself these questions or just think about a sampling method. Does the method chosen greatly influence the validity of the conclusion? Okay. Because you want to choose a method that would uh, make the conclusion a valid conclusion. Okay. And do avoid, if at all costs, voluntary responses or self-selective samples. Because they often have bias, and those with special interests are like are more likely to participate. And a voluntary sample; those are just samples, or voluntary response. That's usually from a sample of those individuals who have chosen to participate, who who volunteered to participate in this study. Not chosen, volunteered. Okay, and voluntary response samples do not give you the. Uh, a good conclusion, okay, because that conclusion from a volunteer sample would not be a good representation of the entire uh, population. So avoid voluntary samples. And also consider other methods that are more likely to produce good results. And later on we'll talk about uh, some other sampling methods in uh, the first chapter. Okay, now let's look at some <clears throat> examples of just this. Here you want to determine whether the sampling method described below appears to be sound or flawed. And in this case, we're looking at a survey of 670 subjects. Each were asked how often he or she ate bananas. The survey subjects were internet users who responded to a question that was posted on the news website. Okay, so here we can see here that this particular uh, survey that was done, it was those who were on the internet and it was those who chose to respond to that particular survey. So this would be a flawed, uh, this simpler method is flawed. And the reason for that is that it was a voluntary sample. So in this case here, you do 
want to avoid any voluntary samples. That's very important because you want to avoid voluntary samples because they don't give you a good representation of the entire population. Right, this next example is this. In a survey of 670 human resource professionals, each were asked about the importance of experience of a job applicant. The survey subjects were randomly selected by pollsters from a reputable market, market research firm. Okay. Does this appear to be sound or is it flawed? Okay. Well, it's not flawed because of the fact that uh, it doesn't sound like it comes from a voluntary uh, sample. Okay. And it was randomly selected by posters from a reputable market research firm. And it doesn't seem to be biased. So, this appears to be sound. Okay. And that's because the data does not appear to be biased in any way. Okay. Now let me jump down to this example here. Well, you have several studies show that after accessing the internet for schoolwork, subjects had an increase in grades. A, broad, a broadband internet provider financed this research. What's wrong with the study? Well, take a look. The broadband internet provider financed the research. So, obviously, this would be what they call a self-interest study. A self-interest study. Okay. Okay. Because that internet, the broadband internet provider, was the one that financed the research to uh, conduct that study. So it was just something that they wanted to do themselves. So self-interest. Okay. The second part is analyze, and that's graph and explore. Every analysis should begin with the with appropriate graphs. Now, in chapter two, we'll be looking at various types of graphs that we can use to uh, display data. One of them is a histogram of frequency distributions. Another, uh, bar graphs are are another way of displaying uh, data. Okay, so pretty much in chapter two, we'll be looking at uh, how we can display data visually. And then apply statistical methods. Now, later chapters describe most the important statistical methods. Okay, so here we'll be looking at things like uh, trying to find the, the measures of center and the measures of variation. Also, we can look at... Uh, things like uh, hypothesis testing and also uh, confidence intervals and also we'll be using technology usually good analysis does not require strong computational skills but it does require using common sense and paying attention to sound statistical methods so here sometimes you don't need to use uh, technology Sometimes common sense will be what can come into play. So here, this is where critical thinking skills can uh, be very vital in uh, making statistical arguments about uh, data. And then conclude whether it has yeah, statistical significance or practical significance. Statistical significance is achieved in a study when we get results that is very unlikely to occur by chance. So this is where we do hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. Okay, because we can take that data and uh, analyze it and uh, determine whether or not 
uh, we get the conclusion whether or not we have statistical significance here. And then next is uh, practical significance. So here we can state practical implications of the results. And common sense might suggest that the finding does not make enough of a difference to justify its use or to be practical. Okay. In this example, you have a test of the Atkins weight loss program of 40 subjects, and they had a mean weight loss of 4.6 pounds after one year. Now, we can use formal methods of st statistical analysis and conclude that the diet appears to be effective. It may have statistical significance, but it does not have what they call practical significance. Because if you look at this, this person only, I mean, you have 40 subjects and the mean weight loss is only 4.6 pounds in one year. You would think they will lose a lot more than that in one year. And all they lost is 4.6 pounds on average in a year. So that would lead you to think that uh, is this diet effective or is it worth going on this weight loss program? If all you're going to lose on average is 4.6 pounds in a year. Okay. And as I stated here, 4.6 pounds is statistically significant using common sense. It does not seem to be very, to very, it does not seem very worthwhile because that's all you're losing in a single year. And there are some potential pitfalls and uh, misleading conclusions. Like in this case here, concluding that one variable causes the other variable when in fact the variables are only correlated or associated together. So want to be very careful of that because you don't want to say that one variable is the cause of the other. And two variables that may seem linked are smoking and pulse rate, for example. Here we can't conclude that one causes the other, so here correlation does not imply causality. Okay? There may be a correlation between smoking and an individual's pulse rate, but we can't say that smoking is the cause of someone someone's pulse rate being high. And here's an example of correlation. Take a look at this example. In the data below, the X values are the weights in pounds of cars and the Y values are, cars, are the corresponding highway fuel consumption amounts in miles per gallon. Given the context of the car measurement data, what issue can be addressed by conducting a statistical analysis of the values? Well, if you look at the weight of the car and then compare that with the height highway fuel consumption in miles per gallon, we could say that is there a relationship or an association between the weight of the car and its final consumption amount? So here we can say is there a relationship or association between the weight of the car and its fuel consumption amount. Okay. Okay. Now we can't say that the weight of the car is the cause of the highway fuel consumption. Okay. Because we have to keep in mind that uh, Correlation does not imply causality. Okay. 
Now let's look at another example. Based on the study of car accidents in winter of men and women who live in different, part, different parts of the country, a researcher concludes that living in the north causes people to drive badly. Do you agree? Do you agree with this conclusion? Okay. Now we always said that uh, correlation does not imply causality. So here we can say here that. Uh, Living in the north does does not cause people to drive badly. Okay, so here the answer there will be no. Now there may be a relationship between car accidents and the geographical lo location, but that does not mean that one causes the other. Living in the north causes people to drive badly. That's not the case. So here we disagree with that. Conclusion. This is an example of causality. I mean, correlation is not implying causality. Okay. All right, next we'll look at small samples as another potential pitfall. Conclusions should not be based on small samples. Should not be based on samples that are far too small. Like, for example, basing a school suspension rate on a sample of only three students would not work with a small sample because you can't make a conclusion on only three students. Like saying the suspension rate of that school is like 67%, but the sample is only three students. Now, you're going to need more... Uh, you need, you're going to need a reasonably sizable sample in order to make it make a, a conclusion and later on we're going to be talking about a minimum required sample size when you're uh trying to be uh a certain trying to reach a, a confidence level level percent later on we'll talk about that particular uh is situation when you're going to have to find out the required sample size Okay, loaded questions is another potential pitfall. If a survey, if survey questions are not worded carefully, the results of the study can be misleading. Like in this case here, should the president have the line item veto to eliminate waste? And in this case, 97% said yes. That's an example of a loaded question. If you reword the question in that, in this case, should the president have the line item veto or not? And then, in this case here, 57% say yes. So it's how you work the question that can be a loaded question because it can persuade that particular individual to answer either a yes in this case, or you can persuade that person to answer no. And also, order of the questions can be potential pitfalls as well. Here, questions are unintentionally loaded by such factors as the order of the items being considered. Would you say traffic contributes more or less air pollution than industry? Worded that way, the traffic was 45% and industry 27%. When the order was reversed, Results was this, the industry, 57%, and 24% said traffic contributes more or less to air pollution. And then a non-response is another potential pitfall. That occurs when someone either refuses to respond to a survey question, and people who refuse to Talk to pollsters have a view of the world around them that is mar markedly different than those who will let pollsters into their homes. Okay. 
sometimes, usually, non-responses could be from someone who makes a telephone call and they don't want to respond, or someone knocks on, the, on their door and try to do a survey and they're not interested. Okay. And also, missing data can dramatically affect results. Subjects may drop out for reasons unrelated to the study, like for example, people with low incomes are less likely to report their incomes. Okay. And also, your census, US census suffers from missing people. Okay. And those missing people could be those that are homeless or those who have low income. Earlier in one video I talked about what a census is. Usually a census, you're not actually getting the uh, information on every member of that entire population because you're missing out on the homeless people and you're missing out on those that have low income. Okay. And then precise numbers. Because as a figure is precise, many people incorrectly assume that it is also accurate. A precise number can be an estimate and it should be referred to in that way. So you don't want to give like that uh, population which was like over I think over 243 million people. I think they gave a precise number like that. You don't want to give that type of precise number because that number could change. Here's that uh, where the population consists of all 241,472,385 adults. They give a precise number. You might want to say approximately 241 million adults in the United States. So keep it as an estimate and it should be referred to that way. Okay and then finally we'll look at uh, percentages. Misleading or unclear percentages are sometimes used. Like in this example, Continental Airlines ran an ad claiming we already improved 100% in the last six months with respect to lost baggage. Now here's the question, does this mean Continental made no mistakes? Okay, so that's very important here. So you don't want to uh, use uh, unclear percentages or misleading percentages. Okay, now these last three examples that I'm going to go over are related to percentages. Okay, now two of them are related to percentages and that is because of the fact that throughout this course you're going to be dealing with percentages and you have to be very, uh, <clears throat> very uh, up to uh, par on how to calculate percentages of a number. Like in this case here, a polling company reported that 53% of 1,018 surveyed adults said that pesticides are very harmful. And here you want to complete parts A through D below. Part A is this, what is the exact value that is 53% of 1,018? Here you want the exact value. All right, in this case here, anytime you're changing a percent to a decimal, you always drop your percent sign and move the decimal point two places to the left. So 53% as a decimal would be 0.53. Okay. Now, 53%, you could also change that to a decimal by taking the 53 and divide that by 100 because, because percent means per 100. So 53 out of 100 would be 53 divided by 100, which would be 0.53. And of means to multiply by 1,018. So you have 0 0.53 times 1,018. 1,018. The value will be 
54. So 53% of 1,018 will be 539.54. All right, Part B. Could the result from Part A be the actual number of adults who said that pesticides are very harmful? Why or why not? Okay. Now that answer there, we came up with a decimal amount. So... 539.54 would not be a actual number of adults who said that pesticides are very harmful because in this case here we need to make that a whole number so here counts must be a whole number Okay, now part C. Who could be the actual number of adults who said that pesticides are very harmful? Okay. Well, let's round that 539.54 to the nearest whole number. Okay. In this case, it'll be 540. Because the 9 is in the 1's place. The 5 is to the right of the 9. It's 5 or more. You always round up to the next number. So 539 to the next number will be 540. So the actual number of adults who said pesticides are very harmful would be 540. Now part D. Among the 1,018 respondents, what percentage of the respondents said that pesticides are not at all harmful? Okay. Well, we have 158 saying that pesticides are not at all harmful out of 1,018. So that's 158 divided by 1,018. And you can punch that in the calculator. Do 158 and then divide it by 1,018. You'll get 0.1. And I'm rounding that out to four decimal places. But here, we want to change that to a percent. So what we need to do here is multiply by 100%. So 0.1552 times 100% will give you 15.52. And we do tack on the percent sign. So 15.52% of the respondents said that the pesticides are not at all harmful. Okay, another example similar to this. A polling company reported that 4%, 49% of 2,302 adults said that they play basketball. Complete parts A through D below. And in part A they ask, what is the exact value that's, that is 49% of 2,302? Okay, so in part A, we're looking for 49% of 2,302. Well, we change 49% to a decimal by taking the 49 and divide that by 100, and that will give you 0.49. The word of means to multiply 2,302. So, if you type 0 0.49 times 2,302, you will get 1,127.98. Okay. And that represents the exact value of 49% of 2,302. Now, Part B, could the result from Part A be the actual number of adults who said that they play basketball? Why or oh, why not? Just like in that last example, the answer there is no. And, of course, counts must be a whole number.
Okay. And then part C, what could the actual number of adults who said that they play basketball? Or what could be the actual number of adults who said that they play basketball? Well, here we round 1127.98 to the next whole number, which is 1128. So we can say that 1128 adults say that they play basketball. And then part D, among the 2,302 respondents, 783 said that they only play hockey. What percentage of respondents said that they only play hockey? Okay, so I'll pull this up. We have 783 out of the 2,302 saying that they only play hockey. So we take 783 and divide that by 2,302, and that will give you 0.3401, rounded to four decimal places. But we need to change that decimal to a percent, so we'll go ahead and multiply by 100%, and that will give you 34.01%. So 34.01% of the respondents said that they only play hockey. Okay, this last example in this video. A report about the decline of Western investment in third world countries inclu included this. After years of daily flights, Several European airlines halted passenger, passenger service. Foreign investment fell 250% during the 1990s. What is wrong with this statement? Well, take a look. It says it fell 250%. Okay. Now, if it fell by 100%, then that means that the investment was totally eliminated. Okay. So it's not going to be possible for it to fall by more than 100%. Okay? So you can write this as an answer here. If foreign investment fell by 100%, it would be totally eliminated. Because 100%, that means all of the uh, foreign investment is gone. So it would be totally eliminated. So in this case here, it is not possible for it to fall by more than One hundred percent. Okay. So you want to be very careful when you use a percentage that is higher than one hundred percent. Okay, so that will conclude this particular video on statistical and uh, critical thinking.